Professor Boyce Davis, thank you very much for this opportunity to talk about uh, the late uh, George Lamming. When you hear the name George Lamming, what comes to mind? What comes to mind, and I'm so grateful for this opportunity, is the, the strength and presence of the Caribbean radical intellectual tradition. He was the first writer from the Caribbean that I encountered during my years as a graduate student studying African literature at Harvard University through a professor named Wilfred Cardi who had written the famous book called Whispers from a Continent. Uh, and he invited George Lamming to campus. Now keep in mind Howard University is that place that almost everybody of note that you would wanna meet from the black world would somehow show up on campus. So George Lamming for me was the first. Um, and that presence, his appearance, his hair, his confidence, um, his love for black culture, Caribbean culture and its links with African culture, all of that comes through when you meet him in that shocking Afro, which as he got older became white, um, white haired and, and more, even more elegant. But he's the first. And I say this because I was on a campus where one would as I said, we meet many different people. And CLR James, the famous, taught a graduate course on Pan-Africanism, which uh, friends of mine would take and I would go and sit in the James class. Um, and actually the next person I would meet and, and hear from would be now the famous Sylvia Winter who, had, who came to CLR James's class to give a lecture. So I just am so blessed uh, by having um, had these exposures at a formative time in my career whereby those examples were so stellar and so confident and so proud and so supportive of the next generation of scholars of which, to which I belong. Um, and therefore he is that person, if I can wrap it up like that. But then beyond that, um, the more, as you know, the more you grow and the more you study these writers, the more you learn. So his breath would extend way beyond, of course, that first encounter with him and the novel in the castle of my skin all of his various works, uh, all of his um, other contributions, and of course his political linkages, and, and the way that he engaged every single one of the Caribbean radical um, activists and intellectuals from Walter Rodney to Maurice Bishop, um, his work in Cuba, where I just came from, was just amazing. So for me, Laming is a giant, he's a griot, he's an intellectual, writer, creative intellectual, um, that is part of a generation that we are losing, sadly, but they've contributed so immensely that we just have to approximate or do the best that we can to, to meet um, their expectations and what they set out as their guidelines for how we can move in the world. What would you consider to be the importance of his writing? How transformative uh, was uh, the work George well, first of all, In the Castle of My Skin, an autobiographical novel, was the first time that we saw um, in writing, um, for me as, as a Black feminist scholar, the presence of the Caribbean woman and how she raised the child um, by herself in this particular case, but with, of course, extended community and family context in many ways that replicated some of our, our own experiences as Caribbean people growing up, the ways in which women have had to sometimes shoulder the burden of, of raising these children. The so-called mother who fathered me figure um, is clearly one that is represented there. But beyond that, the colonial childhood um, and how somebody like Laming grew up in that childhood, it's punitive, um, it's punitive, um, um, ways of, of educating with a lot of physical abuse and corporal punishment um, and all that that means and, and what the young boys in that context would have to experience in order to become men. Um, so Laming sort of, um, it, as part of that generation that grew up in the Caribbean under colonialism and then went to England to, um, to further their, their careers and then became writers and became that formative generation you have then him expanding and then reflecting on what it is to be West Indian, first of all, so-called, 
and then what it is to be a Caribbean intellectual, what it is to be a writer. And he's so definitive about that. Um, so for me, that's the import of Lamming, that, that ability to see the Caribbean in its strength, in its breadth, but in its linkages to not just the so-called mother countries, but to the other places in the world where um, Black um, subjectivity is also powerfully strong. And I love that. So one of the things I learned, for example, is that he was one of the writers attending that important Congress of Black Writers in Paris in 1956. And there he met everybody, Senghor, I mean, you know, Shekhanta Jop, I mean, he met Richard Wright there. I mean, there, and there are photographs, that amazing photograph of all of them. So he was part of that group. And we are so lucky that he lived till 94 so that we could still have his presence and engage him and talk with him and, and really see him um, as for what he uh, it was and is to the Caribbean at large. Some of the people I have talked to in preparation, uh, preparation for this interview, something that kept on coming up is how good a conversationist he was. Um, how did that come out when you listened to him you know, as a student at Howard? And I don't know whether you met him later, but Tell me about him uh, when you met him in Blood and Fresh. Right. Well, he, first of all, that Howard meeting was, I have to say, was one in which I was a timid grad student who probably stayed on in awe of meeting somebody as big as that. So did not have conversation at all, would not have had, had the opportunity to do that, but just admired him from a distance as you did almost all of those other figures. But I would subsequently invite him to speak at my university when I taught at State University of New York Binghamton. And he came um, and um, spoke to my class and gave a presentation. And you know we did the normal things with dinner where you take the writer out. And then he came to my house and listened to Calypso music that I was playing for him and met my children. So he was then a much more you know, at home kind of person at that time, able to relax and enjoy the company of, of everybody. And I was actually asking my daughters recently if they remembered him. One did and the other one was too little, so she didn't remember. But then um, the more significant encounter with him was that I had to interview him for my book uh, on Claudia Jones, um, the book called Left of Karl Marx, because he was a good friend of Claudia Jones in London. In fact, he was one of the Paul Bearers at her funeral. She died in 1964. So he was the one actually who I went to meet in Barbados in his, in his residence then at the Atlantis Hotel. And there he um, really gave me a nice friendly encounter um, so we could talk about her. Um, he showed me the Atlantic Ocean, which from the Atlantis Hotel one could see and it seems he spent a lot of time walking the beach there. And he always reflected to me that when he stood at the Atlantis Hotel and looked out at the Atlantic, he thought of the, the journeys of the slave ships and he could imagine them being out there because that, keep in mind, Bobby, this was one of the first places too that some of those ships docked and, and Bobby, this became like the first British um, slave plantation colony, right? So he, or he always saw the Atlantic in its beauty, but in its strength and, and all its difficulties and what that what that means. And he had a vantage point from that Atlantis Hotel. So that's the kind of thing he shared with, with me. Um, and then also about Claudia Jones, he talked about her as an activist, as a radical intellectual, but the kind of person who, who encouraged him to participate. So he said sometimes, you know, she would, come by and invite him to go to something that she was organizing. And when he got there, it would be like a rally or some sort of major event, political event that, that she grabbed him and went to. And he was the one actually, because people always ask me, how come there's not a significant encounter between Claudia Jones and CLR James? And he explained that to me. He said they moved in totally different directions, that James was much more the sort of intellectual Marxist, uh, Claudia was the street kind of activist. So they were moving in two different directions or two different groups of people. So there was not a lot of encountering with them um, uh, between the two of them. Although there's one discussion of them being on the same panel um, for the benefit of a hurricane that happened in the Caribbean. So he gave me like the, 
personal first-hand view of Claudia Jones. And uh, my book is stronger because of him um, infusing that sense of who she was into my own ability to write about her. And then he wrote the blurb at the back of the book, which is like really, I mean, to have George Lamming write a blurb for you for your book is like, bingo, you know, you won already, you need nothing else. So those are the ways in which um, I remember him as a conversationalist and as a person who was so charming. Oh, and the other thing was I was at Brown University uh, talk, talking about Claudia Jones while he was a professor there. He would visit for five years, he and Amatai do, um, would visit for five years, each in the spring semester or the fall, one of the two. And he came to my talk. And again, because I was giving a lecture about Claudia Jones, I was like quite taken by the fact that Laming was in the audience sitting all the way in the back in the corner, checking it out. <laughs> I was, you know, you know, you had to really represent when when you have that kind of um, that kind of presence in the room, so I, you know, I feel honored. I'm part of a generation that is totally informed and influenced by those guys and those women who preceded us with such strength, such courage, and such clarity about their politics. Or the other related point: there was a conference in Walter Rodney. Um, in Binghamton again a few years later, and George Laming was an invited guest, as was Sylvia Winter. Sylvia Winter was giving a lecture, and quite a few of the Pan Africanist um, scholars, some of them you know, started challenging her about what she was saying and indicating that she seemed not to be clear about what she was arguing and so on. Um, and Laming defended her. He got up and said, No, he sees not, he sees does not see her at all as being mired in her own discourse, which was a phrase one of them used. Um, and in fact, uh, he represented her as one of the thinkers of the Caribbean who was really going into and eliciting some really critical aspects of, of, of Black cultural presences in the new world. And now, of course, Winter is one of the um, critical theorists that everybody turns to. So he was ahead of the curve in representing her at that time and defending her.